Hello and welcome to the webinar on Unleashing the Power of Redis. I'm Christina Cardoza, News Editor at SD Times. Before we get started, I have a couple of quick housekeeping announcements. First, if you have any questions at any time during the presentation, you may submit them using the Control Panel's Questions tab. Secondly, this webinar will be recorded and available on demand through the sctimes.com website in about 24 hours after the event. This webinar will look at how the Redis Enterprise architecture assures predictable high performance and high availability, as well as how to achieve seamless linear scale and grow your data set beyond the largest node in the cluster. Here to discuss this further is Peter Caillou. Peter is a solutions architect for Redis Labs. Now to get things started, I'll throw it over to you, Peter. My name is Peter Caillou. I'm a solutions architect at Redis Labs, and I'll be talking today about unleashing the power of Redis. Um, a bit about myself. So um, I'm a computer scientist, and my first job was working at TomTom Tom as a software engineer. Um, I was working at the MAP uh, um, um, building backend there. Afterwards, I joined uh, Neo4j and, uh, uh, as a consultant, and now I'm a solutions architect at uh, Redis Labs. So my main job or my main task um, is to make you as a Redis Enterprise customer uh, successful with uh, Redis Enterprise. Now about the, the webinar of today. Um, so we will be talking about unleashing the power of Redis. Um, so, so this talk or this webinar will actually be mainly be based upon um, the performance uh, uh, um, related topics of Redis. Um, but I'll kick it off with a brief introduction to Redis for those who are not familiar with Redis. Um, and then we'll talk about some enter enterprise grade uh, uh, Redis for, for example, uh, data grids, how we scale linearly, um, high availability, durability, um, this talk will also talk about, but, about, a bit about data grids and, and actually the cloud nativeness and how we can actually uh, um, use Redis in a containerized world. But first, let's kick it off, right? Um, for those who not, don't know Redis, Redis is actually fast and it's actually extremely fast. Um, and what's even more actually is that it's, it's extremely popular. Um, so this is one, just one of the uh, rankings that I could show you on how popular Redis is. Um, so this is the one from DB Engines. Um, so here we're placed at uh, position eight. Um, what, what is actually more interesting is that if you look on the database model site, you can see that the first uh, uh, four and actually also the, the sixth one are relational database management systems. So in the NoSQL um, world, we're actually positioned at place three. And what's even more, we're actually the first one in, in the key value store world. Um, there are many other metrics on how, where you can see uh, um, how popular actually um, Redis is. One of those is actually um, created by Stack Overflow. On a yearly basis, they actually create uh, a survey that includes 100,000 uh, engineers. And, and, and it's now the second year in a row that we came out as the most popular and the most, uh, sorry, the most loved and the least hated uh, database out there. Um, so, so What's even more, if you, if you haven't heard about Redis even, um, it would be that you've been using it already. Um, so lots of uh, uh, big companies uh, are using it already. Some examples here are Twitter, Snapchat, Tinder, uh, GitHub, and Stack Overflow. Um, so to give you some, some idea on, on, on how they're using this, um, so Twitter is using it for their um, timeline and following. So every time you go into the app or you go into their website, um, the, the results or the feeds of your tweets will actually be uh, served directly from Redis. So only when you tweet, for example, you will hit, uh, uh, or your tweets will be going to a relational database in the back end, but um, some microservices will take care that your timeline or your personalized timeline, timeline is actually populated inside Redis. Um, Snapchat is using it for all their messages they send them, uh, across. Um, Tinder is using one of the specific data types of, of, of uh, Redis to do uh, geospatial searches. Uh, for their user profiles. Um, GitHub is using it uh, uh, as a repository router, and Stack Overflow is actually caching their entire uh, um, website uh, inside Redis. Um, there are many more use cases uh, we can, we can uh, talk about. Um, this is just a, a brief introduction, um, but you can uh, uh, find many more actually on our website on redislabs.com. So what is Redis and what are our top differentiators, right? Um, so, so Redis is uh, an in-memory uh, database, uh, and it's a key value store. Um, so those are the kind of like the bit of the positioning of, of what the database is. And then the top differentiators are its performance, simplicity, and extensibility. So today we'll talk about uh, a lot about, uh, sorry, about the performance and extensibility. So we'll, we'll touch upon those later on. Um, what we won't touch uh, too much upon today is actually the simplicity. 
So, so Redis actually has some built-in uh, data types or data structures. Um, so compare it, for example, to the simplest or the easiest uh, uh, um, key value store, which would be, for example, uh, memcache. Um, the value in, in memcache is always a string. Um, while in Redis, you will have all different data types, right? So you'll have a string, a set, a sorted set, a hash. So you could see it as, as, as memory in a service. Um, um, all those data types are, will have some counterpart in your programming language of choice. Um, so you could see it as memory as in service. So this has some benefits, right? Because your set will effectively uh, um, be served or hosted in memory as a set inside Redis instead of a string. So if you would have, for example, a set, if you would uh, model it in, in, for example, in, into a JSON document that persists as a string, you would have to, um, if you would like to do the intersection of two sets, you would have to fetch those strings, deserialize them, sorry, those JSON documents, deserialize them, and do the intersection at client side. While with Redis, you can actually ask the database to do the intersection uh, uh, at server side and only transfer the intersection towards your client. Um, but, but we can talk about that much more, um, and, and we will have some, some webinars uh, uh, in future about data modeling, uh, but we won't be focusing on this too much on this webinar. So some um, speed difference here. Um, so, so it's entirely written in C. Um, so compared to, so to our key, uh, key value stores that are, for example, written in Java, this has a, a huge performance improvements. Um, the data is entirely served from memory, so it's an in-memory first database. We do have durability, so we can uh, uh, persist your database onto disk. I uh, will talk about that later on. Um, it's uh, a single threaded, um, so a single Redis instance will always be single ad, uh, threaded, and that has some benefits, right? So if, for example, you want to do five operations, um, and you can instruct Redis to do those sequentially, you know that no other client uh, will be interacting uh, um, during those five operations. Um, so most commands are also um, uh, written into an O1 time complexity. Um, so obviously that's not possible for all operations, uh, for example, on sets. Uh, but most of them we, uh, are actually aimed to be O1. Um, there's access to discrete elements within objects. I already talked about that, for example, um, when we have two sets and we would like to do the intersection of those two sets. Um, so that actually also reduces the bandwidth overhead, right? Um, because uh, you, you won't have to fetch the entire object uh, to do that intersection. And then also there are some, some efficient operation uh, um, differentiators, right? So, so it's an easy to parse network, uh, networking pro protocol. You can actually just tell that to it. Um, and we can also pipeline. Um, so this pipelining, what does it mean? It means that if you would know uh, um, 20 or 40 or even five uh, operations that you want to execute against Redis, up front, you can actually send them in a single request. This is interesting, for example, for, for batch loading data inside Redis. So a bit about the extensibility. Um, so we've talked about these uh, data types. Each data type comes with a set of commands. Um, so but what we did, uh, I think in 2014, we opened up uh, the functionality or the ability to uh, create plugins or modules that you can uh, load inside Redis. And in these modules, you can actually define your own data types and the commands you can execute against those data types. And as a benefit of hosting those in inside Redis, you can re reuse all Redis simplicity, right? So the performance, the scalability, the high availability, and also the durability. They can be written in C or any uh, uh, C uh, compiled language. And you can also leverage the existing uh, data structures. So you can combine uh, a set of data structures to make a more complex data uh, type. And this actually turns Redis into uh, a multi-model database. With these modules, we can actually uh, host several types of, 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 of data. Now, um, there, the community has been building quite a lot of those modules, and it might be sometimes hard to find a way, your, your way around in those modules. Um, so we've created a, a module hub, and in this module hub, we're actually going to certify uh, certain modules. So I'm just uh, showing you now a screenshot of that uh, module hub. Um, so so these are just the top four uh, listed there. Uh, there are a lot more out, out there, I think around 30, 40 of those modules. Um, so but these ones are the ones that we actually think if they if got, got either a certified or uh, an enterprise label, or, or uh, um, we, we actually uh, uh, certify them for production use case. And let me just briefly touch upon those uh, four, right? So the, 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 the top left one is Reddit Search. 
So, um, so if you're familiar with Apache Lucene or um, Elasticsearch and Solar, which are effectively using Apache Lucene, it's, it's, it's an inverted index. Uh, um, so, so Redis Search is effectively, effectively an inverted index that we can run inside Redis. And it has some benefits, right, because um, Redis is written in C and Redis Search is also written in C. And um, it, it's hosting the data entirely from memory. Compare that to, for example, Apache Lucene, which is Java-based and is also uh, disk-based. The, the worst case scenario we can actually have is that we get up to five times uh, performance improvements to any um, Apache Lucene based solution. Um, um, it has been around now for three years uh, um, and, and we wouldn't say that we were entirely feature complete, but let's say that the 99% of features that you expect from uh, an inverted index are there. So we can do an autocomplete, we can do full text search, we can do Liebenstein distances, we can do sound text libraries, um, uh, we can do stemming, we can do aggregations. Etc. Um, Redis Graph is another module. Um, so um, Redis Graph is actually going to, to to host your data as a graph, and we're using the Graph Blast library for that. And Graph Blast library is actually going to create your uh, um, adjacency matrix. Is going to of all your nodes is going to persist them into a, a compressed matrix. And Graph Blast, the library itself, allows you to do um, matrix operations on two. Uh, a compressed uh, matrices and it's very performing. Um, so the API we're building on top of that is actually uh, a Cypher API, which is based on the Open Cypher API, which is uh, originally uh, created by by, by Need4j, but that we're now actually uh, incorporating too. Um, then there is Rejson. Rejson allows you to create a, um, a document store out of Redis. So if you have a, a huge or a large uh, um, JSON document. Uh, you used to have to persist that in, 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 into the string data type inside Redis, uh, but now with this vJSON module, you can actually uh, um, host that as a tree. And that has the advantage that if you would like to, in a large JSON document, you would like to update one particular uh, um, part of your JSON document, you can now do that in an atomic operation. Let's say you have a counter somewhere in the JSON document, uh, you can just in, in a single command instruct to increment or decrement that counter. while um, in the past, you had to fetch the JSON document, deserialize it, update it at client side, and then serialize it and send it back to uh, Redis. And meanwhile, it might have been updated. Uh, Redis ML is uh, also an interesting module. Um, we actually use it for uh, machine model serving. So it's not uh, uh, aimed at uh, training your models, but actually to, um, um, to serve them. So w once you've trained, for example, your random forestry, you could uh, um, send that uh, uh, model to, towards Redis. And then and with a single command, you can actually send your vector to Redis, and, and, and we will do the, uh, um, the regression or the classification and send you the answer uh, back uh, very fast. Just a key takeaway from these uh, modules is actually that we, we go into a, a multi-model database. So allow me to introduce Redis Enterprise. So um, Redis Enterprise is a product from uh, Redis Labs. So Redis Labs is actually the home of Redis. Um, we're the, uh, the, 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 the top contributor to the open source project. And um, the company actually started off as a database as a service provider. Uh, so we started off in, in, in 2013. Uh, we now have 8,500 enterprise, customer uh, enterprise customers on our um, database as a service platform. And in 2015, we actually took that uh, software that we're using to host those databases or to serve those databases uh, in the cloud, and we made it available for enterprise customers. And uh, we now have 300 and, uh, uh, more uh, co enterprise customers that are using this software. Um, So I want to touch briefly upon this um, because actually cloud providers and database as a service providers, they actually have different incentives, right? So a cloud provider's incentive is actually to sell you as many uh, um, uh, virtual machines or instances as possible, uh, while uh, a database as a service provider, actually their incentive is to, to, to sell you as many databases, obviously, but also to create a higher margin on uh, those databases. So let's assume we talked about Redis before, so we. If you remember, for example, it was a single threaded and it's in memory. If you need to find a, a cloud instance that has, for example, 64 gigabytes of RAM, um, by default, that would come, for example, with eight or 16 cores. Now, since it's single threaded, you can only utilize one of those uh, 16 cores, but you'd still be paying for them. 
right? So, so cloud providers' offerings actually um, they, they will get a higher margin because you're underutilizing actually those those, those resources. Um, with Redis Enterprise, what we actually tried to achieve uh, because we were a database and service provider first um, was that actually we get a higher margin on those uh, resources. So we will do a multi-tenancy in a single cluster so that actually we can use uh, or reuse uh, uh, multiple cores. We can also, we are also going to reduce the actual uh, usage of memory. I will see that later on how we do that. Uh, and battery, of course, the, the CPU utilization via the uh, multi-tenancy. So here you can see some so some uh, um, overview of the actual features of um, um, Redis Enterprise. In this talk, we'll focus on more on the left-hand side um, of those features. So we'll be talking about cleaner scaling. We'll be talking about high availability with almost instant failover. Uh, we'll be talking about how we tackle durability and also um, how we do active-active due distribution. Um, some other features on the right-hand side, so which are already tackled briefly, but not too much into depth, um, is um, the, the built-in high-performance search, uh, the multimodalness, um, flexible deployment options. We'll talk about that briefly, too. And then lastly, there's um, intelligent tiered access. So uh, imagine you have a, a massive data set. If you would have to host that entirely into RAM, um, that might become expensive for your uh, infrastructure costs. So what we can actually do is we can offload your call data onto a flash memory, right? Um, so, 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 so we will make sure that your your hot uh, uh, keys and values are actually living inside memory, while the cold ones go to um, a flash storage. And that is very interesting, for example, to 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 to, to applications where only 20%, uh, for example, or 30% of your data is accessed regularly, uh, and, and 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 the cold data is, for example, only accessed on a monthly basis. So, how does the um, architecture look like, or or what we do? So. You could see Redis Enterprise a bit as a database management uh, um, system uh, for, Redis and, uh, for Redis databases. So typically in um, um, a Redis Enterprise cluster, we will have three nodes or an odd number of nodes. Um, and we will place those uh, Redis instances uh, inside those um, uh, machines based upon uh, um, how many resources they have available. Um, so we typically have an, um, an, an, uh, an uneven number of nodes. The reason why we do that is actually to create, uh, um, uh, to avoid a split brain, right? So we will avoid a split brain based upon the nodes or on the machines in the cluster, not on the uh, copies or, uh, uh, or the master-slave replication of our databases. So it's also multi-tenant, so we can, in this cluster, host multiple databases. So how would it look like? First of all, we could, we could go, go and create a single database. Um, this database is not highly available. Um, and the master is responsible, in this case, for all your uh, keys. So if you would like to make this database highly available, we will place a slave counterpart on a different node in the cluster. We'll see later on that we can also do this uh, via REC awareness or also availability zone awareness. Now, if your database tends to grow in, in, in either size or in throughput, um, th th this, this is there's only so much you can do with a single uh, single master, right? There's only you're limited to the uh, to, to one core. So what we can do is we can actually we can um, we can cluster your database. So in this example, we're clustering your database into uh, three uh, shards, as we call them, um, and each shard is actually responsible for uh, a distinct set of keys. So now, how do we know um, which key should reside in which? Uh, um, uh, instance. Well, we're actually uh, applying some uh, CRC16 uh, on your key, and then we're doing a modular operation onto that. Um, so in total, we will actually have 16,384 slots. Now, sometimes you would like to have uh, uh, some data to reside within the same instance or within the same uh, shard. So this is actually some, some, some code that is out there. But what we can do is actually we can tag your keys, or you can tag your keys, and you can say, well, I would like to have this part of my key to be hashed. So you could, for example, take uh, a user ID, and then all the keys related to this specific user will reside within the same shard. The next thing we can do is actually make this cluster database to be highly available. So once again, as you can see, we will make sure that the slave counterpart of the master, uh, master shard uh, doesn't reside uh, within the same node or rec zone, uh, um, rec or availability zone. So we, we've, we have a shared nothing architecture. 
Um, so you can see it kind of like uh, as, as a, as a two-layer architecture. Uh, so each node will have an open source layer and an enterprise layer. So our open source layer will be uh, uh, um, what we call Redis shards or Redis instances. Those are these processes, uh, the single Redis instances that we, we were talking about in the past. Um, we also have an enterprise layer, which consists out of uh, mainly three components. Um, there is a cluster manager. This cluster manager will make sure that in the event that there is a network partitioning, that a master will fail over to, so that a slave will be promoted towards a master uh, in case of a failover. Um, there is also a REST API. Um, Redis Enterprise comes with a user interface, so all, the creation of all databases or the changing uh, changes of configuration you would like to make, uh, you can do from this uh, user interface. Um, but it also comes with the user interface is effectively using a REST API, so you can automate everything uh, uh, as you as you wish uh, with this REST API. Uh, it also comes with, with obviously this it's a, uh, a management system, so it comes with um, some uh, uh, LDAP integration to do this uh, management. And the third component is this uh, zero latency proxy. Now we'll talk about later on why we call this uh, a zero latency proxy. Um, but because obviously a proxy tends to in introduce some, some extra latency. Um, now this proxy will actually be the abstraction of the database underneath. So from your client side application, it will look like you have a single endpoint. And you will talk to the single endpoint. Um, and underneath, we might have multiple shards. So your client does need to know where the database is clustered, if it's highly available, if it's durable. That's all abstracted away. Uh, um, um, from, from, from your client-side applications uh, via this proxy. This proxy is also great because it introduces us uh, uh, to do some certain things that are not possible with the open source. So for example, we can do TLS uh, or SSL encryption of your data in, in, in transit um, uh, because we will decrypt it then at the proxy side. So if we would place that back again into our um, three node cluster, we'd get, we, would, we would get our data path and our cluster management path, right? Um, each each uh, um, instance will come uh, with, with some uh, watchdogs. There are node watchdogs, there is a cluster watchdog, um, so, so that we can actually um, um, enable fast failover. So, so that was my brief introduction to, to Redis Enterprise. Let's now uh, talk about um, how we could see Redis Enterprise as a data grid. So um, a recent trend, well, it's not really a recent trend, but uh, the, the trend of mi microservices architecture and polygon persistence is, is real, right? So uh, microservices um, mean that we will create smaller web services with single responsibility or a subset of responsibilities to counter the big monolith applications. And then polygon persistence means actually that each, and single, each single of those web services can actually use uh, and the persistence that is convenient for them. Um, so, so this is great actually because you will use the right tool for the right job, um, but it also introduces some complexity as you can see uh, on the screen, right? So we will have, for example, the authentication that will be using a key value store. We could have a session management store uh, with the API, um, which is using a document store. I'm just picking some of them, right? Um, there's also a customer API we can see at the bottom left that is using a key value store, but also a graph database, for example, to figure out which customers are connected or to make recommendations. Um, there's also a search API, that, which is specifically using a search uh, or an inverted index underneath. Um, so th this has some downsides, right? So you will in create an increased application complexity. Um, there is also a higher operational burden um, because there is a higher cost of ownership, right? Each uh, database will come with uh, specialized administrative uh, uh, and uh, scaling and availability requirements. Um, you will also need um, um, specific knowledge inside your company um, to, to, to maintain those databases. Um, lastly, there is also a suboptimal uh, resource usage because each, each, and single, each single of those databases um, will require their own dedicated bots or server servers, and that actually uh, reduces your, uh, uh, re your deployment efficiency, as we have seen before. Now, what is great, right, we, we've talked about uh, Redis Enterprise, which is multi-model, uh, sorry, which is a multi-tenant, so in a single cluster we can um, optimize your resources uh, and, and allocate them to different databases because it's multi-tenant, and we've talked about these uh, modules, so in each single database we can enable um, a subset or, uh, of modules um, we can actually make simplify this, this architecture, right? 
So um, this is where we call uh, see, see Redis actually as a, a data grid. So at the bottom, we can see that um, in, 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 our, in our Redis Enterprise cluster, we'll have separate databases. Um, some of them have modules slotted, uh, other ones are the simple plain uh, key value store, right? So, so now our authentication API is using Redis as a key value store or has a separate database. The customer's API has a Redis database with a graph module loaded, but is also using some key value store um, uh, to, to, to serve its API needs. Um, the catalog could be uh, uh, doing some caching inside Redis uh, while the data is actually fetched uh, uh, um, uh, regularly from, from relational database management system. Our search index, uh, uh, our search API is now using uh, a Redis instance with this uh, Redis ready search module loaded, et cetera, et cetera. So this kind of like simplifies your, your architecture, right? Um, each database can have a total different um, configuration. They can scale in a different way. So we can, uh, you'll see that later on how we can scale those databases. Um, they can also have different durability uh, configurations, et cetera. Now we can even simplify this picture even more, right? So at the top, we will see that all these APIs have to talk to each other um, to, keep it, to keep their databases in sync. Uh, but also to serve uh, data um, to upper uh, lying uh, um, services or microservices. So um, one data type we didn't touch upon yet, or two data types actually, is, is PubSub and Streams. So, so Redis comes with a uh, built-in uh, PubSub, which is actually um, um, you can publish messages to a certain channel, and then your clients can subscribe to certain uh, um, channels and receive those messages. Now, the downside of this PubSub is a bit it's fire and forget. So if your client is not listening, we, we actually, um, you, we, you will never receive that messages. Uh, that's why uh, there is a second data type, which is called streams. It's, a, it's, it's less lightweight as the pub sub, but it comes with the advantage that you will actually, you can record all the messages inside a single stream, and then you can either use it as a topic or as a queue. Um, so in a topic, each uh, um, service can actually um, go through the entire chain of events uh, and process their messages. When communication drops, they can reconnect and, and, and take up where they left uh, or, or, or consume the last message. While in, in the queue uh, setup, you can actually uh, try to, um, to, 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 to paralyze your work. So in that case, we, uh, Redis will make sure that each message gets delivered to only one consumer. Linear uh, scalability. So the story I want to tell here is that actually um, we have on the left-hand side, we have a single master and a slave, and we would like to move over to um, two masters and two slaves. The reasons why we could do that, I already touched upon them, is either our database grows in memory and it becomes inefficient uh, to serve that from one uh, single process, uh, but also because our throughput uh, um, uh, requirements increase and we would like to maintain a very low latency per operation, right? Remember again that uh, a single Redis instance here is, is a single threaded. So how do we do this with Redis Enterprise? I, I, I believe you could already see the complexity of doing that. Um, without Redis Enterprise, you, you can already see that this, this might be a burden um, to, to do that without any downtime. Now in Redis Enterprise, you have the benefit of this proxy component. So on the left-hand side, all the clients will talk to this proxy. They have an abstraction of this database and they talk to the single proxy. The proxy always talks to the master. The slave is there to, uh, um, to offload the master so that the slave can take up, for example, responsibilities to do durability, to do replication to other clusters. Um, it can also uh, um, 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 do backupping. Uh, it can do alerting, etc. All those functionality can actually be tackled by the, by the slave so we can actually maintain a very high throughput and low latency on the master. Now, what is the first thing that we do is we add two more slaves uh, to the picture. And those slaves are copies of uh, um, the first one of the master, the second one of the slave, and they are uh, responsible for 50% of the data set. The next thing that we do is actually we, we, we tell the proxy to, to queue up all the requests for a bit, and we drain all the connections. So we will make sure that everything is in sync. So all the masters and the slaves are all in sync, we assure. This takes up a couple of milliseconds. And the next thing we do is we will update the routing table in the proxy with this uh, hashing uh, um, and, and, and algorithm that we discussed before. So now 50% um, of the keys uh, uh, will be sent to the master one, the new master one, the slave, the original slave is now M2, and that one will be serving uh, the other 50% of the keys. And the last thing that we do is actually we trim uh, 
uh, those uh, two instances because they actually no, need, no longer need to serve 50% uh, of that data. And all this happens, uh, um, well, the entire process happens depending on how much size you have in your database within a couple of seconds. Um, but your client-side application will not, uh, um, have, uh, will not find any downtime and it will only see a couple of milliseconds extra latency to a sub subset of operations. Um, so, so this is really powerful because obviously you, you don't know initially where your application is going to go and, and how much scale you will need. Um, um, but we can actually just uh, um, keep on doing this process over and over again. And how can we do this? Well, on the left-hand side, we have a single node uh, with four shards. We can add another machine to the cluster. At that moment in time, it won't be hosting any shards. And then we can rebalance your shards. Um, so then we will have two per machine. And then we can do resharding again. And we can do this over and over again, right? We can add then again another machine to the cluster and scale it out again. So I mentioned this zero latency proxy. Why do we call this a zero latency proxy? Um, so that's because we actually we do multiplexing and pipelining. So our proxy will uh, maintain a, a fixed number of uh, um, persistent connections towards the charts. And um, when your application on the left-hand side sends seven uh, different requests simultaneously, we will actually send those requests over those uh, uh, um, um, persistent uh, uh, connections. So you can see that requests one, two, and three, and four will go over um, the first connection, and uh, uh, five, six, and seven go over the second connection. So that is effectively multiplexing. Now, the second thing we do is we will pipeline them. So I've, I've talked about it previously. So we can actually send multiple operations and a single request to the database. And those two things combined uh, makes that, well, in, 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 in the worst case scenario, uh, there will be a zero latency impacts. And in the best worst, uh, case scenario, we will actually improve um, the throughput and the latency uh, towards your application. So something about displacement, uh, um, there are different scenarios. But for each database, you can have a separate configuration. Um, so in, on the left-hand side, um, we will have a dense placement policy, which means that we will place as many master shards on the same node, and there's only a single uh, um, proxy endpoint enabled on that node. We can also do a sparse placement policy. Why would we do that? Well, because on the left-hand side, we're limited to, this, to the bandwidth of a single node, of the network bandwidth. Um, while um, on the right-hand side, um, we can actually uh, better utilize the network bandwidth of those three machines. Now, um, what happens if you hit, for example, on the right-hand side on the first uh, proxy and your key doesn't live within that node, you will have to go over the wire to the other machine, so the proxy will go and forward that request. Um, so, so you will have some more um, inter-nodes uh, traffic, yet you can actually increase uh, um, you, you, your, your network usage or your, your, your throughput of your database. Now, you can see that this won't scale linearly. So, so the next step what we can actually do is we can create or, or use a client that is a bit more smart. And instead of the um, hashing actually happening, uh, sorry, the hashing of the key and, and figuring out at which slot it uh, resides, we can actually do that at client side. So each client will actually make a number of connections to different proxy endpoints. Um, however, the client will know which key resides onto which node in the cluster. And in that way, we can actually fully utilize the bandwidth of each node in the cluster. And we've tested that, and we've tested that quite thoroughly. So the first thing you can see is that this here we, we create actually a six-node cluster. I know we need an odd number, but forget about that. Uh, a six-node cluster with 120 shards. Um, and we get, in the, in, the, in the screenshot, we get up to uh, 11 million uh, operations. Um, I, I want to add that all those operations are sub-millisecond latency. And that in this specific benchmark, we, we, we took a reasonable uh, pipelining, so which means that each uh, request will contain nine operations. Um, so, but to, to, to prove actually the, the linear scalability is that if we would go from six nodes and 120 shards, we go to 12 nodes and 240 shards, we get 20 million operations per second, still one uh, uh, sub one millisecond latency. And then again, obviously, if we go to 18 nodes, we add, our, uh, we add another six nodes and 120 shards, we get 30 million operations. Um, and in our latest benchmark, you can actually uh, go into the link above later on. We actually have 50 million operations uh, with, with 26 nodes. A sub millisecond latency. Let's talk about high availability. So we have some lessons learned. Um, we've been running uh, Redis Enterprise for five years in, in, in production. 
um, we, we're managing, uh, uh, we've managed 550,000 uh, databases, um, over 50, more than 50, 50 data, uh, data centers or availability zones. We had 2,000 node failures and zero data loss. Um, and we had a complete data center outages even. So we, we, we did learn our lesson and our enterprise software has been, uh, uh, been improved continuously. So I will talk about some concepts that we do for uh, high availability. The first one is that we quorum on the number of nodes and not by shards. So a typical setup that you would expect is that a master will have two slaves to be highly available. Now we, we, we've, we've separated the, the, the responsibilities and we will actually make sure that we'll have a quorum based upon the node level and not on a database level. So that has some benefits uh, um, with regards to your uh, infrastructure costs, right? So we will have a single master, a single slave, because in a three node cluster, by the way, according to computer science, you can only survive n failures in a two n plus one cluster. So in, in, in this cluster, we can only survive one node outage. So there is no point to even have uh, um, a third, uh, sorry, a third copy of your database. A third node should only be there to uh, create a majority or to figure out which other node uh, um, is the majority in your cluster and to avoid a split brain. So if you could imagine, for example, that we would have a, a two terabytes database, um, in, in, this, in the left-hand side, we would have two terabytes of RAM, two terabytes of RAM, two, two terabytes of RAM in those three machines, while on the right-hand side, we actually can have a very small node uh, that doesn't have that much memory that is just there to, uh, to establish quorum. And, and this is one of the things that I talked earlier, uh, earlier on, uh, where we have different incentives than, for example, cloud providers. So it's not only the, 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 the reduced cost of, of, of memory, it's also, uh, um, less network traffic and also because if you have a multi-tenant cluster you can actually host more databases within the same uh, so in, in a smaller infrastructure so it's easier to manage small clusters tend to be easier to manage the second concept is that we can do pure in-memory replication and um, so the copy from a master to a slave would go in in, in in the basic open source would go by taking a snapshot of your database um, um, serializing to disk, copying this uh, snapshot, and then loading it inside memory. You can also do some open source diskless repl replication um, where you will actually um, um, avoid um, the first snapshot and you would snapshot directly to the uh, second machine. Um, now we've updated uh, um, Redis to actually do pure in memory replication, um, so which is up to two times faster and it's actually only limited to the network bandwidth in between those machines. So we're no longer doing this snapshotting. We also made the watchdogs part of the cluster. So um, on the left-hand side here, we can actually see that uh, the watchdogs um, is just a possible setup, right? Um, um, the, the open source sentinels would be uh, not part of the cluster. So um, what happens on the left-hand side is that there's a network partitioning, but the watchdogs can still see the master, so they think everything is fine, while your clients can no longer access your database because they can only talk to the slaves. Um, we made the watchdogs part of the cluster. And we also have one slave less, as you can see on the right-hand side. Um, so what happens is, is that in the case that there's a network partitioning, the watchdogs on the right-hand side will see that the master is no more reachable and they will trigger a failover instantly. So in this way, we can actually trigger a failover much faster. Obviously, it depends upon which uh, deployment you have and, and, and what stabilities of your network infrastructure, but typically we get up to less than 10 seconds or single digits uh, failover time from master to slave. Then the uh, REX zone awareness or the multi-availability zone awareness. So um, we, we can actually make sure that your slaves and master and slaves never, um, are never circulated in the same availability zone or the same REC. Um, so this has some benefits that if, an, if an entire availability zone or your REC goes down, um, your database will still, all your databases will still be available. Um, so one requirement that it has is that um, the sum of the two other uh, availability zones, sorry, the nodes in, in the cluster should still be more, or the sum should be more than a third uh, uh, availability zone. So in the event that uh, um, one availability zone goes down, um, your nodes still uh, form a majority or a quorum. Let's move on to durability. So one of the things that we saw is that um, for data persistence, actually, uh, um, for both persistent and ephemeral storage, typically that is placed together with the nodes uh, on the same machine. So in the event of the, the machine entirely failing, uh, you would have to spin up a new instance. So one of the things that we did is we actually uh, split up our ephemeral storage and our persistent storage. Uh, so our persistent storage will be uh, mounted to uh, a network drive, for example, 
and and um, and everything will go into that persistent storage. So in the event that we need to create a new instance, we can actually reattach that volume, and uh, it will be uh, uh, populated with the latest state uh, that we have available. This is particularly interesting, for example, for um, when we move on to pods, right? So each node could be, for example, a pod. And if you're familiar with Kubernetes, we'll touch upon that briefly in a bit. Um, we can actually re we can use a stateful set and attach a persistent volume back to this uh, uh, pod, and everything will uh, um, be healed uh, perfectly as before. A second concept is actually we have tunable durability, so we have different configurations for uh, persistence. So we could have a single uh, non-replicated instance that we could uh, serialize your data to disk. Uh, so, so sorry. Uh, do your data to disk. By the way, we have three options here. We actually have multiple options, but the three main options is that we can do a snapshot, which would be uh, uh, taken, for example, on a regular basis. Uh, but if you want to keep the latest state of your database uh, uh, persistent, there are two options. There's either an append-only file uh, on every second and uh, uh, on every write. So if you would do, for example, the append-only file on every write on the left-hand side, that would introduce an extra latency, obviously, for your write operations. So we could tune for speed, um, so that's the middle of operation. So your slave will be tackling this persistence. Um, so which means that your master actually, without any impact of the uh, whether there is persistence or not, would still have uh, uh, served the same throughput and latency. And we can also tune it for reliability, and then both the master and the slave will actually take this persistence uh, task. Two more chapters to go. So this one is uh, talking about cloud native. Um, so I'm assuming that uh, um, lots of you are going to the cloud or are already in the cloud. Um, there are also different cloud vendors out there. So we could imagine in the future an application where we have some uh, um, Redis Enterprise cluster in Azure, in, in AWS, and Google Cloud, and also on-prem for, for, for more uh, uh, secure private data. Um, so, so what we see that other, other applications actually go for either an eventual consistent system or a strong consistent system. Now I know, know this 100 milliseconds is just a uh, quite arbitrary number. Um, the, the, from the 100 milliseconds to the 200 milliseconds does make sense um, in those systems. Um, so, so, so does that make sense inside Redis, right? So Redis is an in-memory database. Um, you're already paying something extra in, uh, to serve your data uh, entirely from, from memory. So does it make sense to wait till your data has been uh, uh, conferred and replicated to the other data centers? So we wanted something more smart. We want to have local read and write latencies. And so for that, we used um, a concept which is called CRDT, or conflict-free replicated data types. It's not something that we invented. It has been around, and it's based upon academic research um, for quite a while. Um, it's, it's a consensus-free protocol, and it's effectively strong eventual consistency. So it's going to detect conflicts uh, in, 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 in write operations based upon vector clocks. Um, so we will use those vector clocks to make sure that uh, there's a, a, a causal ordering or, or, uh, uh, of events. And if there is a conflict, um, each data type, so we've talked about these different data types, will have a, a specific conversion function or resolution function. So this is how it could look like. Um, we have a geo-distributed database. Uh, in, in three locations, and uh, the strong eventual consistency actually gives us one millisecond latency. An example of this conversion function could be we have a counter that resides into three replicas. We would increment, decrement, uh, increment the counter at the same moment in time, so in the same causal ordering of events. So what is the conversion function going to be? That's quite easy. It's just a sum of the operations. So plus 200 minus 300 plus 1,000 is plus 900. So we go from 500 to 1,400. So all uh, replicas will see eventually uh, strong eventual, uh, actually, the, the, the 1,400. A different conversion function is, for example, for sets. If you would add, add, add B, add A, remove A, then actually the addition is going to win over the removal. So every, every replica will effectively still see um, uh, the uh, element A in its set. I'm speeding up a bit to uh, leave some time for uh, Q&A. So the last section is actually containerized. So um, what we kind of like wanted to do is make our Redis Enterprise offering available to multiple platforms. Um, I'm just picking one here, which is Kubernetes, which tends to be very popular nowadays. Um, so, so Kubernetes, uh, for those who are not familiar, it's a portable, extensible open source frame framework um, platform for managing containerized workloads and services. Um, so it can actually, it used to be only for 
stateless workloads, but uh, um, since 1.8, there has been support for uh, stateful. By the way, we're at 1.11, I think, uh, um, for Kubernetes. Um, so that, that has matured. Meanwhile, um, it encourages the usage of microservices, so it, it, it fits entirely into this polyglot persistence and, and microservices world. And it should also be portable, so it, it should enable you to have less cloud lock-in because you could move your entire Kubernetes cluster to a different provider. Um, the only thing I want to touch upon this is actually that uh, Kubernetes is going to orchestrate, but it doesn't really actually orchestrate your containers. It's going to orchestrate the resources and deliver them to, to the, to the uh, uh, container, container, uh, sorry, containerized applications um, based upon how you um, declared or described um, which, uh, how many resources you should have available for, for each uh, um, container. It also does much more, right? So it also allows you to do some, some, some basic uh, health checks but also it's going to do self-healing. In the event that a pod dies, um, it, it will make sure that a new pod is spun up. Um, now, when it spins up a new pod, actually in a stateful set, it's going to reattach that persistent volume to that pod. Um, and so we talked about durability previously. Uh, so we're actually using the stateful set uh, uh, um, capabilities of Kubernetes. Now, we've also created a Helm chart. So, so Helm is kind of like a dependency manager uh, or, or like, well, the, the package manager for, for, for Kubernetes. So you, you can actually uh, consume some pre-configured uh, uh, Kubernetes resources. And uh, with a single uh, instruction, you could deploy a Redis Enterprise uh, cluster. Um, I've talked about that more in a, a different webinar. I will share the link to that one later on. But I just wanted to briefly show you how that would look like. Um, so, so here in this example, um, we could see that we have uh, um, three pods with a red uh, a, a square on top of them. Those are actually going to be our, our nodes of our cluster. Um, and you also see that they will have a volume attached to those. Um, so these, these pods are part of our stateful set. And uh, we also have a controller. Uh, this controller will actually um, make sure that all databases that are uh, running within your cluster, or Redis Enterprise cluster, are actually um, uh, uh, um, served as a headless service within uh, Kubernetes. And, and how does this look like if you would uh, take a, a clean install, for example, and we would do this, for example, on PKS, uh, at the, the Pivotal Container Service, um, we, we could see that uh, uh, the second section, the second sorry, screenshot, um, uh, has, for example, three Redis pack uh, nodes, 0, 1, and 2. Um, and, and the third section, actually, you can see that uh, that's actually the output of the stateful sets. We could see that there's a desired state of three, and there's currently a uh, um, uh, uh, a number of three available. The last uh, one is actually going to be the controller. The controller is the, is, is the pod that is going to make sure that your database is um, um, uh, exposed as a headless service. And we could see that actually uh, um, uh, on the uh, the first section where we have Redis and Redis pack and Redis pack headless, which is uh, the, the name of the database um, that we're exposing. This is how it could look like in OpenShift. So it's a similar setup. Well, one more thing I want to touch upon the stateful set is that actually it allows us to do a rolling upgrades. Uh, so um, one thing that is, 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 is a contract of stateful sets is that only one pot at a time will be uh, touched upon. So Kubernetes will make sure that is the case. So and because we have a, um, in, in case we have a high available database, we can actually bring one pot entirely down and replace it with a different pot, right? So we could either um, make sure that the pod has more resources, or we could make sure that, for example, it has a new software uh, or the newest uh, software of Redis Enterprise installed uh, without any downtime. So just to recap about this webinar, I spoke uh, briefly about, about Redis, about the three uh, um, top differentiators being uh, performance, simplicity, and accessibility. We talked a bit about um, multi-mole databases and data crits. Um, we talked about how we could actually scale uh, Redis linearly. And uh, we can actually do that without any downtime. Um, we also spoke about how we tackled or which concepts we, we enable within Redis Enterprise for high availability and durability. And lastly, I talked briefly about how we can actually, um, with Redis Enterprise, support cloud-native data and, uh, and, and even um, run Redis Enterprise within a containerized application. So I still have some resources for you. So, okay, so these are the resources. Um, so the first one is, is where you can actually find the Helm chart to deploy. 
uh, in, into to, 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 to your, your own Kubernetes cluster, that will go with just a single command. It has quite some good documentation on that uh, GitHub repo. Um, there's a Redis Enterprise Docker image you could use uh, to play around on your local machine. Um, the webinar I've spoken about, and we actually get a demo of this uh, um, 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 Redis Enterprise um, on Kubernetes sling there. Um, we also have a new Kubernetes operator to work together with OpenShift, which has actually more insights about or has more uh, um, is more clever about which operations you can do um, within a, a Redis Enterprise cluster. Um, there's our module hub I talked about, and if in case you still have uh, uh, any questions after Q&A, uh, you can always email uh, expert at redislabs.com. So thank you so far for listening to me. Um, once again, uh, my name is Peter Cayo. You can email me always on uh, peter at redislabs.com, and you can find me on Twitter at Cayo. Great. Thanks, Peter, and thank you for a great presentation. I believe that is actually all the time we are going to have for today, but if you have any questions, please submit them now, and we will make sure to follow up with you after the webinar. Again, that was Peter Caillou, Solutions Architect for Redis Labs. I would like to thank Redis Labs for sponsoring today's webinar, as well as attendees today for joining us. Until next time, I'm Christina Cardoza with SD Times. <laughs>